will try to be non-technical. And in between, if you have any kind of doubts, please feel free to ask me. I don't have any problem even if you interrupt me when I am speaking. Now, the title of this lecture that I have put is Archaeology of Ceramics. It can mean many things, but I am primarily trying to introduce you uh, to the world of ceramics of the ancient time. And what do we do with that? And how do we use it for our archaeological understanding? And then what kind of information comes out of it? So what are the methods of doing it? So I'm planning to give you an overall introduction about the ceramics and the ceramic analysis in archaeology. Now, I was told that you are all engineering graduates. So you may not have much idea about what exactly is a subject archaeology is. So I thought I should introduce you to the subject of archaeology. There are many definitions available in the books, but what I consider as the definition of archaeology is this a set of methods applied to study the past. History is also the same thing. It's also studying the past. But what the difference is that we have a major difference in the way we approach and the sources that we use. So here, the source is material remains. You have artifacts, structures, ecofacts. Some of them are perishable, some of them are non-perishable. And then tangible means those materials that you can see, intangible components, which is one of the most important components of the culture. Archaeologists are not able to get information about the intangible components, but there are certain works that are being carried out in that field. Whenever such kind of works are happening, there are questions arising because there is a lot of subjectivity in that. So that is what archaeology is. And the second one is history, of course, the sources are different. That is the main difference. And both, of, both the groups are trying to understand the past. Now, what is most important here is that the material remains. The material remains are the prime focus of archaeological study. Whenever we are trying to understand or when, uh, the past, our, we try to study the material remains, and a lot of descriptions and all those things are done. Scientific analysis are carried out. We try to see from what context it is coming, all those things. So based on that, we are trying to understand the past. And one of them is ceramics. We get it in lot large number because it is baked clay. It does not undergo any kind of decomposition when it is buried in the soil or when it is buried in the, because it was already baked. So the property of the clay underwent change and it became a hard material. And once it is broken, the community do not use it. They throw it away. That is what the archaeologists pick up. And they try to study that material and try to understand the culture. And sometimes ceramics become one of the identity of the culture. You must have come across, if, oh, of course, engineers may not have read it. But in archaeology, we keep on debating uh, on the even, give, we keep on even giving nomenclature to certain cultures based on the ceramic types. Now, this particular word, ceramics, that comes from karamios, which means baked clay. And now, the term ceramics, you have to use it with a little caution, because in archaeology, this term ceramics has become more or less synonym with this pottery. Pottery, when we say it is a functional one, because these are all vessels. But when you say ceramics, it includes many things. It can include even this, many of those materials that you are seeing here the fuse and all those things, they are all ceramics. But where in archaeology, when we use the term ceramics, we only mean pottery, that is it. But if you read the literature, earlier literature, that is, many of those uh, archaeological works of uh, uh, early, uh, early century, uh, no, first half of the 19th, 20th century, you see that they have been using the term terracotta. Even today, in some of those uh, European literature, if you see, they use the term terracotta because both mean the same, but then in archaeology, the moment you use uh, ceramics, it means only means pottery, which is a functional thing because the classification or the terminology comes from the function, it's a vessel, that is it. Now, you get it because 
while you heat it, it becomes a hard material and it survives. That is a major drawback in archaeology. We all speak about cultures based on, especially from the time of settlement, our many of the inferences are drawn based on the ceramic as a ceramic uh, typology and qualities of the ceramics. But we forget one thing that prior to this baking technique was you know, discovered or included, there were unbaked ceramics and most of them have gone away because they don't survive in the past. Like these are all primarily vessels. Before this terracotta material came into existence, there must have been vessels made of leaves, vessels made of something else, there must have been. But all of them underwent decomposition. Because of that, we have no clue about it. Then these are all the, some of the earliest uh, times, if you, you know, see, when was the raw material clay, or uh, when was it used for the first time by the, you know, people? And how did they start shaping it up and all those things? These are all some of those examples. 30,000 BP is the earliest evidence of uh, a clay object that we have. And then we have this uh, Vatilan dob kind of construction that when you have this huts and all, which are made of bamboo and all, it, a plastering is done with the clay. So then we have also clay bricks, which are being used. So these are all some of those examples of ceramics. Now, how does, uh, you know, we need to look at ceramics from an entirely very different point of view, that they are just not vessels. They were used by societies. They were used by people in the society. Now, societies, anthropologists have divided societies into two categories. One is a simple society, the other one is a complex society. A majority of the Indus Valley civilization settlements and all those things, they are all part of the complex society because they have we can assume that they have some literature and all those things. We have, we have scripts and all those things, which are not deciphered. That is a totally different issue. But there is polity. There are many things. Many of those intangible components or the components of the superstructure are there in the Indus Valley civilization. So we can take it as a complex society. But prior to that, there was Neolithic community. They can be considered under the category of simple society. So there is a difference between these societies. And this difference is primarily appearing because of the kind of components that are there in the society. So the nature of the components determine whether it is a simple or a complex society. And we have the emergence of ceramics that begins in the simple society, which are all the mostly the Neolithic settlements. Now, this is a complex kind of things. Actually, the appearance of ceramics, is it OK for you, the way I'm speaking? No, you need to tell me. Should I simplify it further? Hmm? <laughs> it's a challenge, actually. That is <laughs> anyway, when you look at uh, the appearance of ceramics, that coincides with the origin of agriculture. And uh, that is when you start, uh, you know, when you start doing farming and when your production becomes surplus, there is a lot of scope for storing them. So you use different kinds of mechanisms. And also, when you start cooking materials, you know, cooking the food and all kinds of, there are also you require vessels. So these are all some of those, uh, you know, the ceramics, the appearance of ceramics coincide with the origin of agriculture. And also, it is relatable to the early farming community. That is why I'm making such a statement here. And then, what happened after this agriculture, you know, came? Uh, if you look at the development of human behavior over a period of time. There was a nomadicism, then incipient stages of agriculture you can see, then agriculture, then agriculture leads to a kind of permanent settlements. From the started permanently settling down slowly and slowly, several things started developing. So here, the settled way of life, that leads to crop production, and that changes the social and economic organizations. Slowly and slowly, things started getting structured and introduction of ceramics come, then also several changes take place in the tool typology because more new forms started getting adopted, appearing and all kinds of things. Subsistence pattern changes, public architecture comes. So these are all the behavior, how the behavior changes. A nomad who had been wandering around, a society that had been wandering around, when they come and settle down in some place, 
which is because agriculture was initiated and as a result of which several kind of changes take place in the society or in the overall and social formations start taking place. So now, when you get into this complex kind of uh, societies, order and all kinds of things, we have this is, uh, actually I'm not going to speak fully about this particular slide because this I generally use it for explaining technology and development of technology. But what I want to say is that the last line you may look at is that egalitarian or ethnically differentiable kind of communities. You have, that is how it begins. Now, when you have, but then when you look at this, uh, there is uh, not much specialization or something like that. Everybody is more or less self-sufficient or part-time specialization, occupation like that it is. So a low degree of standardization. When you are trying to look at the technology part, and if you want to study, understand, when you analyze materials and all those things, and if you want to say that, okay, there was a standardized technology or the technology was getting standardized, all these things need to be taken into consideration. Then rank societies. There is uh, some degree of standardization and also non-centralized production, part-time specialization, occupation. These are all the different types of societies that we have. Then we have ranked to state level society where is high degree of standardization and centralized production incipient to full-time specialization. And state level society where high degree of standardization, full-time specialization. So the complex society, well, the, the kind of complex society that I mentioned earlier, they have these different types of characters. So that is why you get large variety of ceramics, you get large variety of material, you get large variety of structures. All those things are happening because the society is undergoing this kind of transformation. Now, if you look at the, yeah. Uh, the question is, it's a very tricky question. Specialization and standardization. I will give you the answer. Now, in the, uh, you know, I'm taking Indus Valley Civilization as an example. There are many things which can be produced only by a trained, skilled kind of craftsman. For example, the blades, the, the stone blades that the Indus Valley people are, the, the Chalcolithic community are crested, the Edding Ridge technique, the, the kind of flint blades or the chert blades that they have had, the faience beads that they have had. You had a workshop on faience uh, two weeks ago here? Yeah. Then the metallurgy, uh, the copper metallurgy that they have had. Similarly, there are some special types of ceramics also. So these uh, there is a kind of a uh, lot of integrated effort that need to be uh, put in. And also there is a repeatability. If you see, I'm taking a standardization, how I define standardization means the product is more or less the same. The product properties are more or less the same. The size is more or less the same. Now you know that uh, the German standardization like, uh, for instance, they, their standardization is in micron level. ASTM, that is American Standard Testing Machine, they have a standardization. That is, a product it gets standardized. Now, in case of archaeological materials, you may not have that much precision. But when I look at the vessels, like for example, a pot, a bowl or something like that, what I do is that I define my own parameters using which I can look at the standardization. So I may take the diameter of the vessel. Okay, a particular vessel I will take. I will take bowls as one particular type or I will take a cups as one type. Then I keep measuring the diameter and there won't be much variation in that one. That is because there is a standardization. It is not machine made, it is human handmade. So that variation you have to, you know, accept it. Maybe something around a, say, a, a centimeter difference. That is standardization. That is how we look at standardization. Specialization, when we try to specialize, see, when you have uh, a very politically uh, powerful society which takes care of the whole, all different tiers of uh, the society where multiple occupations are there, then only this kind of uh, specialized, uh, so, you know, specialized works can happen. But otherwise, see, the government has to protect them. They are, the products need to be sold to, or the products need to be distributed like that it has to happen. Their specialization, 
develops. Did you get the answer? No, the more complex, the more standard. See, I was showing you that uh, anthropological model, the earlier ones. The more complex uh, the society is, uh, there can be certain advancements and also there can be certain kind of problems. Both the issues are there. The complexity of a society is assessed by looking at the artifact assemblage, by looking at the structures, by looking at the architectural features, and by looking at the engineering skill, by looking at the management skills. All kinds of parameters are taken into consideration while you are looking at it. So now we have uh, the particular problem here is that there must have been ceramics appearing in the earlier part also or the vessels, vessels made of clay, but we do not have any kind of evidence of it because they do not stay, they undergo decomposition and they disappear slowly and steadily. Then archaeological, the earliest uh, ceramics that has been, which has been reported from an archaeological context is from Katil Hayuk. That is, uh, it is uh, Turkey and uh, 8500 BC. And also, then the next one I'm showing. And the third one, but it's a date, actually there are certain kind of uh, contradiction about this particular one. As some of those uh, scholars believe that it is datable to something around uh, 12,000. It should be somewhere around 14,000 BP, 12,000 BC, that is how they write it. And we generally do not write BC after, before, Something once you cross 10,000 years, you do not write BC. But this particular article it is written like that, 12,000 BC. So I'm just putting it like that. But then thermoluminescence dating has uh, given it uh, something around uh, mid 6 million AM BC. Thermoluminescence dating has its own problem. The thermoluminescence method is a dating method that has been used to determine the age of the pottery, and uh, which is an entirely different lecture. I will not be doing it here. So that has given it a different uh, date. So there are some controversies. But anyway, for certainly, I can say that this 8500 BC is more or less an acceptable age. But about the Indian subcontinent, we have difficulties. Because we, if you ask me the question, which is the earliest evidence of ceramics in the Indian subcontinent, I would imagine that, of course, Ganga Valley may have had it. Because Ganga Valley, you have uh, the Mesolithic stages. And also, you have. Uh, lot of Mesolithic settlements there, in different stages of uh, agriculture you have evidence there. There should have been ceramics, but they may not have been baked, that is a problem. So unless it is baked, it won't survive. Then we have the Baluchistan region and uh, uh, many that Indus Valley region. So now, what I just want is that there are now, people keep on debating in archaeology that how did this idea emerge in the mind of humans to make ceramics? I won't be able to answer that question. But then, where was it originated? Where, where did this technology develop? How did it travel? These are all some of those questions that uh, archaeologists have. And one of those very prominent archaeologists who have been involved in this kind of debates is Gordon Child. He's no more now passed away in 1958 or 59. He proposed that this technology or the idea of technology or the idea of making things or the idea of transforming raw materials into certain other kind of usable products that travel from uh, you know one place to another and some kind of dispersal has taken place. Some other people believe that no, it cannot be possible because it, it could be there could be a multiple source also. And that is more or less uh, acceptable because when you go back in time, if you go to somewhere around uh, 1.3 million, 1.2 million or 1 million years before present, and if you look at the stone tools that you see uh, all over the world, you see there is a lot of uniformity in their typology and all kinds of things. So it is quite possible that uh, multiple sources of origin for these kind of technologies may be there. As far as Indian subcontinent is concerned, there is Western influence, you have it. 
There is something called indigenous development. And the term indigenous is very tricky. I'm using it in a specific context. And also there is East Asian influence that is in the Eastern India. Because people have been traveling here and there. So the technological transformations have been taking place. So it is mostly happening during the Neolithic, Chalcolithic phase. You know, that is somewhere we can say in some of those places, areas that uh, the Indus Valley region, you have the Neolithic culture there. And some other places you don't have Neolithic, Chalcolithic only is there. So somewhere there it originates. And the dates vary from region to region. And now this is a very complicated kind of thing. Uh, like uh, when you want to reconstruct the lifestyle of the human beings or the society, uh, we try to, you know, the archaeologists try to extremely depend on the artifacts. And archaeology is like a court language because you need to supply proof. You have to say that, okay, this is, you are saying like this because of this reason. Like that we have this. Uh, so because of that, we have uh, different techniques like exploration, excavation, and application of various scientific aids. And we also use ethnographic data. For a country like India, it is quite uh, suitable because we still have certain communities who live in a very traditional way, who, has no, who have not lost their skills and all kinds of things. Now, if you, and I'm again going back to the appearance of ceramics, you know. There has been some kind of links that took place between climate and culture and somewhere around 9000 BC it becomes more or less stable because the Holocene period begins, end of Pleistocene and you had uh, those major glaciations and all kinds of things disappear and LGM that is last glacial maxima and all those things. As a result, uh, slowly and steadily those things, the impact of those things disappear. And there has been some kind of a very interesting kind of stability that is developing by around 9000 BC. That is a time when you see these alluvial plains and uh, these fertile predominant areas and sea coast desert with mineral resources, grazing areas. That is a time you see population slowly and steadily emerging in these areas. So before that, if you see, you do not have the consistency. I'm not saying that they did not leave their own. From around 9000 BC onwards, you can see, okay, slowly these kind of areas are getting thickly populated. And then what happens is that, uh, earlier slide I showed that there are different kinds of uh, raw material resources available within the desert regions and all those things. Then there is some kind of unique distribution of resources taking place. And that led to the interregional trade networks. Before that, I should say some kind of uh, exchange mechanism must have been there. Because when I say trade, don't misunderstand it for currencies involved in that or no. This is uh, just an exchange kind of thing. Uh, then economic competition. Slowly and steadily, this leads to, this is, I am making my own kind of hypothesis. That leads to a kind of economic competition and uh, that leads to more political and uh, economic interaction. So the society has to struggle if it has to develop. So when you are looking at this 9000 BC, when you look at the alluvial plains, the coastal regions, the desert regions and all those things, all of a sudden you start seeing that things are emerging there. People uh, started living there, various kinds of activities are taking place there. One of them is ceramic production, but I cannot just always refer to ceramic production. There are many kinds of activities taking place. And this one is leading to the kind of sharing mechanism and as a result of which, you know, I chose an area to live and I got some different kind of material, economic competition. All these things have worked very much towards building up civilizations. And there is also a question, this is from a book written by Brian Fagan, where he is trying to see what exactly is the difference between an individual and a society. I'm not going to mention about that. What I am only trying to say that how the identity of a thing changes. Here what you can see is that this particular is a plain vessel. And this is something, uh, you know, kind of a line that is, it has a very different kind of line. 
this is a triangle, filled up triangle, and these are all two lines, and in between you can see some amount of shades. And this is a simple one. Now, once this one moves here, it gets a different personality. And one, once this one moves here, it gets a different personality. And this one gets in here, its personality changes. When all these things keep changing, or all these things get added to it, its personality changes. And that is what archaeologists are looking for. Whenever we are trying to look at, whenever you are doing artifact analysis, what we are doing is that we are trying to see what are, what kind of variations do take place. So here, this is how an artifact, and several artifacts, you know, they make sub-assemblages from their sub-assemblages to assemblages, and you have archaeological culture. So where you have a large kind of material and also identity, common identity and identity sharing, many things are there. And then one more thing that I would like to say that an attribute can represent an individual and that, uh, you know, then combination of several, you know, attributes that can represent a group, similarly community, society and all those things. That would require at least one hour for me to explain this. I'm not. Now, this is another thing. Like, if you look at the development of uh, cultures in the Indian subcontinent, this is how it can be. Earlier, there used to be several terms like pre harappan early Harappan, proto harappan Harappan, like that. You have archaeological literature. If you see, there are hundreds of terminologies. Uh, now, during the early 80s, a person called Jim Schaffer and Lichtenstein, they tried to look at the radiocarbon dates of, uh, that was obtained from almost all these sites. And they found that there was some kind of contemporaneity in the radiocarbon dates of, uh, like, uh, pre harappan cultures with that of the early Harappan, early Harappan with that of the mature Harappan, like that there was some contemporaneity. So this made them think, what exactly is happening? Because pre harappan should ideally give a date that is earlier than Harappan. But it is not happening here. There is something else that is taking place. So they decided to think in a very different way. That is, there are main centers existing, surrounded by small, small centers. So if you do not get all those cultural traits of the Indus civilization in a small settlement, you may have a tendency to give it a different kind of nomenclature. So they proposed a processual model in that, where they said that there is a early food producing era is there, followed by a regionalization era, followed by an integration era, followed by localization era. So all these pre harappan early harappan cultures were accommodated within the regionalization era. And the classical harappan was taken into uh, the integration era, and late harappan post harappan were taken into localization. So that is so. And using this, you can come, you can then further develop the, uh, and explain India's cultural development. You have the Mahajanapadas that can come in the regionalization era. Mauryas is an integration followed by localization. Then you have the next integration taking place during the Gupta period. Then you have the Sultanate of Delhi, you have Mughal, you have British, and then you have today's India. So there is, it's a historically, when you look at how the society changes, undergoes change, you can see regionalization, process of regionalization, integration, localization, because it's something like, a, you know, it cannot stay steady for a longer period of time. This is an unfortunate thing. There is a theory in economics, which is known as bubble theory, because something, you know, it, it can hold it in, with time for some time, and afterwards, it slowly and steadily, it has to disappear. So, such kind of changes do take place in uh, cultural context. So if you look at the cultural geography of proto-historic India, you can see this is a very popular map. It's not mine. Actually, this I borrowed from a uh, former archaeologist. is no more now. Mauricio Tosi. He gave it to me, this one. Here, what is he trying to show is that, uh, see, these are all some of those, uh, this one, this particular area. This is the Indus system, the Balochistan part and all those things. And here is the Ganga system and here this is the, this is the southern India. So what we can do is that this, the cultural 
materials within these three regions, there are some kind of differences in that one. Even if there is a contemporaneity, there are a lot of differences. Now, when you are looking at the Indus Valley, I'm just taking, using Indus Valley as one of the examples. And when you are looking at the Indus Valley um, formation, what you see is that you have this uh, certain area. This is one of the areas where you have this, uh, uh, the distribution of this particular graveware is there. Face Muhammad graveware, that is how it is known as. This one is the Nal region. And here, this is Gujarat. You have uh, pre prapas Anartha, Padri, Mikesh Red River, Black and Red River, these are all the types of vessels. And this is Amri, and you have Kodiji, and you have Soti, Kalibangan. Now, what I want to tell you is forget about this part. Now, these were there were societies, there were several settlements which existed during in this region during which is a, during a period which is prior to somewhere around 3000 BC. And the identity of these societies is coming out through ceramics. Because you identify them because they have used either black and red ware, or they used micaceous red ware, or they used a grey ware. So this is one of the importance of ceramics in archaeology. Because we also started, you know, identifying several cultural contexts based on this. Now, so there is a distinction. These are all the small, small settlements which has separate identity. Now we have something around 11 regional traditions uh, that is during the Neolithic and Chalcolithic period where you have, uh, I have given you the details of it. So these regional Chalcolithic ceramic traditions, they have contributed a lot to the development of Indian culture. Means ceramic is one of the things that has contributed. You have it in Baluchistan and the adjoining areas. Then you have it in the Mid Ganga plain that is Neolithic, Chalcolithic. These are all the different types of uh, uh, different types of uh, you know regional traditions. Now, what I want to show you is that this is the whole region of the where you have the Indus region, you have the Oman region, and you have also have the UAE and all those things. So. What I'm trying to show is a Dilman, then uh, Magan and Meluha. This is, I'm taking you back to 2500 BC. It is assumed that this is how it was. And I'm showing it to you because I want to tell that there had been some kind of trade activity going on between Meluha and Magan region. And the trade, what exactly was the trade is something that is a matter of dispute or you can debate on it. But from my studies, it is still unpublished. That is a petrographic analysis that I had done. Uh, I had done some samples from Salut, a site in Oman. Uh, I don't think it is uh, mentioned here in this one. And I had done some samples from Mohanjadaro. I had done some samples from Gujarat. So I, I could understand that there is a spe uh, special kind of ceramics that is called as a, uh, black slip jar that the black slip jars that are that were found in Mohanjadaro region were similar to that of the ones that was found from the Salut in Oman. Similarly, the cooking vessels that you have uh, uh, we have got it in Gujarat. We find the same type of cooking vessels in Oman. Actually, Mark Kenoyer and uh, me is a publication that is. That should be coming out soon. Like he only supplied these samples to me. Then I did uh, uh, some photographic analysis of that. And so this is ceramics are becoming a part of the trade commodity. And they are also becoming a material of supporting the trade. Like for instance, this uh, black slip jar, it may not have been, it may have been used as a container for something, but cooking vessels definitely, they went there as a result of the function. Now, why should an archaeologist study ceramic and what is the, this is the, my, actually the lecture begins from here, okay. So previously I was giving you some kind of introduction to uh, have a mind to appreciate what is ceramic. Yeah, please. Sir, so you mentioned that uh, 
pottery or ceramic can transfer from like one land to another land space yeah. so how do you identify like which region it belongs to which region it belongs to like the black pot you mentioned so is it from the saudi arabia region present day i will give you an answer but then you will have to wait for another one hour okay yeah, i'll be showing how we do do it what we do is that we look at the typology means ceramics have a specific kind of form okay and that particular form it is an indicator of the region and it is an indicator of the time period so these two things like for example you are all wearing trousers now okay if you look at the trousers of uh, early 70s you will see most of those were bell bottom trousers and prior to that there is a tight one and nowadays actually you have jeans which are torn and all those because the human beings do not want that monotony there is some kind of change fashion change taking place in case of clothes similarly you have the same kind of changes that you can see in the ceramic forms so by looking at the ceramic forms you identify the time period and then its fabric texture its nature its qualities all those things like for example if you look at uh, a material that is uh, you know produced in a reliance mill and a material that is uh, produced in dinesh mill you can look at the cloth and you have a different texture you have a different feel the quality based on that quality you can say uh, to which uh, can, you know region it belongs to but then i will come to that later little, little detail now these are all the uh, kind of information that you can get from ceramics uh, for all the, the kind of archaeological information the first one is from the form of the vessel function like uh whether you know cooking vessels then you have different types of vessels is more or less you know you have special kind of bowls you have special kind kinds of dishes basins etc so all those things you know that okay they were either containers of food or they were serving vessels etc etc so slowly and steadily by looking at that you then you need to integrate several other kind of clues so that to reconstruct the cultural um, story then evolution of ceramic forms and decoration similarly just a few minutes ago i said how the trouser typology changes similarly the ceramic typology also undergoes change and by looking at that typology means its overall appearance so it changes and by looking at that you can establish the chronology chronology means the periodization then classification of ceramics from its attributes that is a cultural part then uh, relationships between potter and community so many things actually till this distinctive decorative styles the kind of approach is a mixture of anthropological and archaeological approach that you use whereas from here that is characterization technological studies all these things these are primarily you know you study it using methods that are based from science like my i have been working with microscopes for almost 35 years now i use polarizing microscope and i have been trained in scanning electron microscopy and all so we use most of these techniques to study the material the ceramic material and uh, we you know try to understand its technological parts and all so the first part this one till here you have to choose an anthropological method whereas from here onwards you will be using a scientific kind of method now if at all you want to study archaeological ceramics you need to know how the ceramics are made in different you know even the contemporary workshops and all those things so we have uh, when you look at the development of the subject archaeology itself uh, until 1960 the approaches were different from 1960 onwards there is some difference so we call it as traditional archaeology that is the archaeology before 1960 and archaeology after 1960 as new archaeology lot of new different kinds of thoughts have come in and if you look at uh, traditional archaeology it was also good i am not saying that it was bad but traditional archaeology lot of uh, the scope for explanation was fairly less there and also you would not have much uh, you know dating methods with, with which you could establish the dates in a scientific process whereas in case of uh, new archaeology people like different people uh, their names are there louis binford david clark and all those 
they started incorporating many other methods and techniques and all those things and they started coming out with different types of interpretation. So the Binford is one of those persons who is responsible for many kind of changes in the archaeology. Now what he did was, when he was reading this kind of uh, literature and all those things, he found that archaeologists have been cataloging things and they have been very descriptive. And beyond that, they are not in a position to appreciate the culture, explain things and all. So there should be some other kind of method should be there. So what he thought is that, he thought that uh, we need to have some kind of uh, quantitative sampling methods, testing, etc., etc. But then people do not appreciate this kind of uh, works because they use very complicated terms, very complicated uh, words. And even if you look at the dictionary meaning, it may not, you may not be able to understand that because each word has got a philosophical basis. So <clears throat> what they have been doing is that when you are excavating, because we do excavations and all those things, and uh, archaeological data is static and that comes in to the present. So it becomes a very complex kind of thing. Now what you are doing is that your material is lying in the present and you are trying to understand the past. So based on the, because these were some of those uh, confusions that he has been facing and he thought that ethno-archaeological, you know, ethno-archaeology means you try to look at the contemporary traditional societies and try to understand what exactly is their lifestyle, how they have been doing many kind of things, different occupations and all those things. So based on that, you will be, get some idea how to explain the activities in the past. So, from static material to dynamism, that is what he has been trying to understand, okay, or known to unknown. So I also did, uh, when I started working with the ceramics, I, need to, I needed to understand how these are manufactured. So I approached uh, different porters. I have done, I must have visited at least more than 100 porters in my whole life in different parts of India as well as in the neighboring countries. So overall, these are all the stages of production. So unless you watch it, how it is happening, you will not be able to appreciate the archaeological ceramics. Because if you read the archaeological ceramics, the descriptions that are given in the archaeology, by the archaeologists about the ceramics, to understand that, you know, some of them have visited the Porter's workshop and some of them have seen how it is happening. So their descriptions and the people who have not seen these things, their descriptions, those are very, very different. So these are all the stages of uh, ceramic manufacturing. And this is one of the examples that I am giving. Actually, this is a site that confused me for at least uh, four to five years because I had done clay mapping from this region. This is a lake in Sri Lanka where I did a lot of work. And uh, interestingly, this lake is something around a uh, small lake, maybe around uh, 150 meter in diameter. And always there is water there. And uh, I did a uh, lot of clay analysis from there, but never I could get a matching thing. Then what I did was I had to do a clay mapping there. That is every 10 meter collected samples, around 15 samples were collected and they were, uh, you know, I did X-ray diffraction, other kind of photographic work and all those things. To, uh, what happened is that the composition of clay within in a deposit itself is not consistent because uh, there is a lot of water which is getting accumulated in that one. And when wind keeps on blowing, waves or ripples are created and that will do some kind of sorting. So when, they, when it does this kind of sorting, you know, the heavier particles subside first, the lighter ones slowly and steadily. So because of that, I note, I realized that 15 samples had 15 different compositions. More or less there is general agreement. So this becomes very difficult because especially when you are trying to work on trade, exchange, etc. in with the archaeological ceramics, if you are going to depend heavily on the scientific data and if you are going to take minor variations within that, there may not be minor variations. You have, Minor variations are visible to you, but in reality there may not be that kind of variations because within one deposit itself you can have variations. 
So here is trying to collect. And now, not all types of clay is useful for making uh, ceramics. This is what clay is. Actually, clay has got different definitions. For a sedimentologist, it is any siliceous particle whose size is less than 2 microns, that is clay. But this is the chemistry, that is aluminosilicate hydrate, that is what it is. Now here what you can see is that it has aluminosilicate hydrate, that uh, kaolinite, in that formula itself we have a 2 H2O, the 2 molecules of water. And if you take a clay deposit or if you take a clay crystal, it has 3 types of water in it. One is the adsorbed water or the hygroscopic water which is present on the surface of it. Second one is the absorbed water that is present between two clay crystals. Clay is very thin and platy. It, between two clay crystals you have this. The third one is the lattice water which is this 2 H2O which you see here. Now, when you heat clay uh, within a temperature range of 50 to 80 degrees Celsius, the first water goes off, that is the adsorbed water or the hygroscopic water goes off. 100 to 150 degrees Celsius, you lose the second water, the absorbed water. And this 2H2O, depending on the clay mineral, between 350 degrees Celsius to something around 750 degrees Celsius, this one also goes off. So, that time, when this 2H2O, when it disappears, it loses all the properties. It is no longer clay. It is a decomposed clay. And even if you want to uh, and understand its mineralogy and all those things, it becomes very difficult because you cannot study clay mineralogy because it has lost its properties and it has gone back to its initial stage because clay is a weathered product of the rock. So it goes back. Potter is reversing the whole process. So this is very important because if you do not put sand into this clay and make it, reduces its plasticity and makes it workable, the port will not survive. Because if you make a port from pure clay and heat it, first water goes off without doing any damage. Second water, when it starts going out, it will exert pressure. And the third water, this one, H2O, this particular lattice water, when it goes out, when it wants to go out, it will break the vessel and go. That is why porters have the tradition of adding sand and vegetable materials, then donkey dung, any kind of fibrous material, they mix it with clay. And uh, so those materials and also sand, that makes the clay porous. It makes it sufficiently porous. As a result of which, uh, due to stress and strain, you know, uh, breaking of the vessel take place. This is how some of the clays look like. What is he doing is that he is using a hammer and breaking it. Sometimes the clay may contain high amount of sand and sometimes some of the deposits may contain very less amount of sand. It depends whether it is a primary source or whether it is a secondary source. Secondary source can be even the hundred source, we do not know. This is a traditional way of sieving. Actually, what you are seeing is that bamboo reeds and they have made a sieve. And what they are doing is that they are getting rid of the larger chunk of larger particles from there. And some of the potters, those who are using, suppose you are using the saji mitti, which is available in the Ganga Valley, and those materials some are collected from certain areas, you need to add sand. And some of them from where you need to remove sand. Actually, potters are very, it is a very difficult kind of uh, group of people. The potter who is trained in Mathura clay, he will not be able to work with another kind of clay because it becomes very difficult for them. And this is the preparation of the clay paste, that is mixing it with water. Uh, this is uh, mixing it with hand. This is foot kneading, what is he doing? Because what he is trying to do is that he is trying to this particular clay, actually this is very fine and you have to add sand into it. And the distribution of the sand should take place homogeneously. So that is why he is doing it foot kneading. And this process goes on for four to five hours sometimes, not at a stretch because he cannot do it more than 15 to 20 minutes. So it ta takes him two to three days always adding butter. So this homogeneous mixing 
or distribution of the sand grains should take place in a homogeneous way, then only the porosity also becomes homogeneous, as a result of which breaking does not take place. Again, hand kneading. And this is how they make the vessel, that uh, there is a division of gender also within the, uh, you know, uh, job, division of, you know, in the job, uh, gender-based division is there. Uh, she is rotating the wheel and uh, he is throwing the vessel. And this is how the vessel is thrown up. And now he has taken it out. What is important here is that you should see most of this pottery which is thrown on the wheel, it does not have the base. There is a hole always. Because in archaeological literature, you might come across that the pottery is wheel made, pottery is handmade. No pottery is wheel made, no pottery is handmade. This all uh, multiple techniques. What they do is that this hole you can see. And this hole, then what he is doing is that he is using a dabber and a ham paddle and he is trying to join the parts. Here. So two techniques, two to three techniques have been used. Hand making, wheel making and so in many of the archaeological literature you might see it but it is not correct. Small vessels you can make using one technique. These are all the tools that are used for making vessels. This is the paddle. It has these deep lines. And you come across this kind of paddles in archaeological context also. I have seen it in somewhere around 3rd century BCA context, this kind of material. That is, this is uh, primarily, uh, these grooves are made for a purpose because the clay should not stick to it, the vessel should not stick to it. So you have a gap and uh, that is what the science of it, I was told. Now then they apply slip, slip is a surface coat, like what they do is that a thick solution of clay is made and it is applied on the surface so that the surface looks beautiful, it looks very pretty and all those things. And then they also Describe the use of that thing, the lower one with grooves. Sorry? Uh, can you describe the use of that thing uh, with grooves uh, in uh, second diagram? The left one with grooves. This one? Yeah. Yeah. I'll go back. Huh? You see this one? This man, he is using that. So he is using the same kind of dabber on the right side. And on the his left hand is inside. And then the left hand, he is holding this one. This is a stone made one, okay? And that is kept in the inner side and you have the body part and you have the hammer here. So you hit it like this and shape it. Now, this particular material, it has grooves. Because the grooves are there, it will not stick to it. If you, this clay is wet and if you are using a flat kind of hammer, clay will come out. So here, because it has grooves, it doesn't stick there. It will, yes. And it becomes a design also. It will become a design also. They have uh, different types of... Uh, actually, during the early historic period, you have a type of pottery called paddle marked pottery. Design which is made of paddle. Actually, you can see this becomes... A, uh, uh, then the mark becomes visible. No, but you don't see it in the pottery that is prior to that. Because once this is done, this kind of marks are formed, what they do is that they keep it back on the wheel and they again, you know, keep on uh, polishing the surface. And there is a process called, then they apply the slip. Once the slip is applied, uh, you can see this is a slip solution and all those things. Here is a slip solution, okay. Once the slip is applied, this is what the slip is, that red color. They also apply this uh, uh, pigments on it, that is painting on it. Then what they do is that they keep it on the wheel and take a pebble, maybe a quartz pebble or a hematite pebble, and keep it close to it and move the vessel. So it gets burnished. So all these marks which are there, that disappear. But consciously they have used it in certain other cultural contexts. You can see 
paddle marked uh, uh, you know paddle marks as paddle mark pottery we call it, call it as paddle mark pottery and in most of the cases paddle mark normal paddle marks are also there then also different patterns are formed they become decorations after some time so here it is uh, they are applying this uh, pigment and then now the baking vessels the third one is my own creation so we will not touch it at the moment uh, i am giving um, i will be including it in my lecture tomorrow uh, the first one is oxidizing that is uh, you know ample supply of oxygen is there so most of the vessels will be red in color because ferric oxide gets formed actually ochre is used and it has uh, iron in that one and in presence of oxygen it gets formed ferric oxide whereas in inadequate supply of oxygen that is reducing you have ferrous oxide getting formed which is darker this one uh, while i was um, doing ceramic analysis of the indus valley pottery i got very interesting kind of results the slip is red in color the pigment is black in color and both had high amount of iron and there was no nothing else so iron was giving red color on one side and black color on the other side so how that was that was possible because you and it is in the same vessel baked in the same condition so this oxidizing reducing reoxidizing cycle that was developed actually i got this idea from a work done by a person called walter noll he had worked on the greek attic vessel and there he had observed this oxidizing reducing reoxidizing cycle so then i tried to experiment it and somehow we managed to get it not 100% accuracy but i managed to get it you have different types of kiln that is open kiln and closed kiln so you have this is a open kiln what you have is a shallow pit which is something around 2 uh, to 3 meter wide and maybe around half a foot uh, deep and what you do is that you keep husk and all kinds of things and arrange this pottery like this and then what you do is that you cover it and also you apply different kind of clay or something like that on the surface so that it holds the heat this is another type this is a pot within this pot you have you keep smaller pots and also put oudan cakes then the pot is uh, kept in a uh, pit and all around the pot you fire it and slowly and steadily heat penetrates in and the inner side carbon monoxide domination takes place and it becomes black colored vessel in ganga valley this kind of firing i have noticed they call it as gajakutta that in open kilns we have mostly the oxidizing process and in the closed kilns we might have the reduce you can convert it in there uh, it's not that no. simple no it's not that simple <laughs> This is close kiln. Uh, this is actually from Sri Lanka. What you can see here is that the old pots are used as walls here, and this is all the different stages of development of this kiln. And uh, this is a very different kind of kiln. This is you find it in South India, you find it in Southern Karnataka, and also you find it in. Uh, Southern Karnataka in the is a region where you have Tamil population. In Karnataka region, there are some areas where Tamil is spoken. So, wherever Tamil is spoken, you will find this kind of kilns. This is an upsidal kiln. It can accommodate. Uh, is actually it has a huge area inside, and this went to Sri Lanka along with the Tamils, and you will find it in northern Sri Lanka. You will find this kind of kilns. and you can accommodate something around uh, 1000 to 2000 vessels and this is a closed kiln it does not have any specific name actually that is it this is an archaeological example it's a conjectural reconstruction from mohanjodaro what you can see is that in this one you have two chambers the baking chamber which is on the upper side and the fire chamber on the lower side and then this is separated by 
a plate which has lot of perforations in it. And you can also see that uh, fuel feeding aperture there and there is a valve on the top. So once you close the valve, it, the firing takes place in a, without a regular draft. So it means uh, oxygen supply reduces there, carbon monoxide increases. Whereas if you keep the valve open, continuous draft is maintained and as a result there is oxygen supply. So you can create both oxidizing atmosphere as well as reducing atmosphere, both the atmosphere you can create it here. So this is the background, this is how you, you know, try to understand ceramics. You are going to a portrait workshop and you are trying to study these things. Now, organizing ceramic data, that is, I, how an archaeologist approaches ceramics. He has three ways of approaching. One is categorization. That is primarily sorting out the material. You look at the similarities and differences. You take two pieces, if they are similar, you keep them together. If they are different, you give them separate. That is categorization. Second is classification, which is more complex, where you have to define a type of vessel, a type of ceramic. We call it ware, W-A-R-E. So wares have to be identified and wares have to be defined. For defining ware, you need to look at the attributes. Like attribute means when you look at the ceramic, that what catches your eyes first is the color. Color, the surface finish, the shape, if there are any decorations on it, and the quality, the texture, whether it is slipped or unslipped, all kinds of features. All those things have to be there when you are trying to group them. So when you say the group means its definition should be complete, all these attributes have to be included. Then comes characterization, where you are trying to group them based on their genetical relationship. Like uh, the parent, mat what exactly is a parent material? Suppose, you know, I produce certain vessels from here and distribute it into 10 different directions. But then if you pick up all those vessels and genetically they can be related to one particular spot. So this will encourage archaeologists to work on trade exchange mechanisms and also Trans, uh, traveling of the vessels, lot of traveling of the vessels are there. So, for which we generally do uh, based chemical analysis is done that is used on the chemical, uh, the chemistry of the material by picking up the trace elements or rare earths or something like that. You try to group them, or else you try to group them mineralogically. Now the most unfortunate part is this. If it's, I would say it's unfortunate because the porter makes a vessel for one purpose and it is used by the society. And the archaeologist's classification is no way uh, similar to that of the porter. Porter is function based. Whereas in archaeologist, he doesn't know the function because I do not know the pottery that I am carrying with me which is something around 4,000 years old or 5,000 years old. What was the purpose of it? I don't know. So what I do is that I look at the external attributes, all those. That is how the classification takes place. So this conflict creates some problem in archaeology. Whether are we saying the correct things while describing the ceramics or are we not you know, saying uh, the incorrect things. But somehow you have to arrive at some kind of compromise. Now, I do not know why I am saying this because I have been facing this when I have been working with uh, ceramics from different parts of India. I have been facing this problem because uh, some of the things have multiple functions which becomes very difficult. Unfortunately, many of those uh, residue analysis that uh, we have tried to do from Indian context, that did not succeed because probably uh, bacterial action is intense here as a result of which many of those residue materials do not survive. Now, <clears throat> these are all the common vessel forms and vessel part, which is very important because we look at this, the changes that is taking place on this vessel part. That is how we try to make the comparisons. So these are all the different vessel parts. This is a very funny picture from the internet. I, somehow I liked it, that is why I downloaded it. You can see this is the rim. And above this rim, 
there is an area which archaeologists call it as brim because that is brim and its feature whether it is flat whether it is curved whether it is pointed that also becomes one of the criteria for us to define because after some time it might be indicative of the period or a cultural context this is again the vessel attributes you can you can see these are all the diagrams from um, professor mark kenoy's book on ceramic analysis i'm using it because uh, it gives you an overall idea about it what you can see is that the body part the base the base the base and again the base and the base here the base here now what i want you to look at is that this base is more or slightly rounded here whereas this one it is flat and this corner is something very special this one this is flat and here it is slightly interesting whereas this one it has it's like a leg you know it goes out it comes out and it is slightly flaring up and this is again rounded and this is it's a ring it's a ring and it is a cross section it is shown this is flat and this one is going up it's like a bottle so these bases you don't find all these bases at the same period you find the bases undergoing evolution like the the to begin with it is firstly it is around no, a rounded base then it becomes flat then that flatness gets defined slowly and steadily it progresses that is a good point this is i will accept your proposition in two cases one is in case of cooking vessels cooking vessels generally have a a uh, round base and then it uh, you know is something called carination and goes in and then there is a rim so when it is fired the flame hits here and the flame goes like that you can take it out without burning your hand and second one is that there are ports which has round base and they are used for storage also they don't remain steady for them there are stands jar stands circular jar stands are there in if you look at the indus ceramics many of them have flat bases some of them have rounded bases and those which have rounded bases to begin with in the initial stages they had separate stands on which they were kept then this legs started developing we call it as leg you know, three points you know then you have flat ones then you have different variations in then it becomes a tendency because that monotony has to come out slowly and steadily it comes out so the changes are taking there is function based also but not necessarily function based because human beings they have intelligence right? they also think in different directions when you if i ask you to define technology technology is not necessarily to meet the need of the society the cognitive part of the human being that needs to be appreciated am i correct <laughs> so this is there huh? now here you can see again the changes see here then this way this way here it is going up here you can see this is a disk it is becoming a disk like thing this is known as disk base and this one is a pointed disk point edge pointed disk and then again there are certain changes so these are these become one of the you know key indicators of the vessels and this some of these uh, shapes some of these forms you know they survive only for a brief period of time because it loses its popularity or something like you know it does not become uh, attractive to many people and they are not in a position to continuously use it for some reason we do not know that again here here you can see different bases so these these are all the this is the attribute that you are looking at if you are getting a base fragment this is the attribute that you are looking at but if you are getting a rim then it becomes more complicated you can see different uh, this is everted that is going out here you can see pointed ones you have this uh, rounded ones you have this flat ones 
uh, beveled, that is how they are known as. Then you have perpendicular ones, featureless, rounded, flat, inverted. So whenever you are trying to look at the ceramic, before you start uh, looking at the shape, the first thing that you should uh, see is that whether it has uh, its mouth area, whether the rim is going in or going out. There are only two types of ceramics. One goes in, the other one goes out. There you will have, once you are able to identify that, then all this become uh, useful. So, then different archaeologists have different terminologies for that. It's very confusing if you look at the ceramic literature. So, but then the, some people write it as club shaped ones, then this is quadrangular here. And all these kinds of, uh, you can also see how it undergoes evolution. See, this is the rounded one, this becomes triangular. Then here it develops a beak. Then beaks, that beak becomes prominent like that. You can see that. It's over a period of time this kind of changes take place. So we say that, okay, prominent beak or beginning of the beak. Then this is another shape. This is nail head. You know, if you take a nail and its head, cross section, you can, it looks like that. So it has different variants actually. And it undergoes changes. And finally, it becomes something like this. Another example of special attribute. And this is again paintings and all. Then decorations. And whenever you are looking at the archaeological literature and trying to study the ceramics, Whatever, you know, this, this line is a major main thing. This indicates a separation between the exterior and the interior. This, the right side of the line, it denotes the exterior. And this one is the interior. So this line is on the inner side of the vessel. Here, this line is on the outer side of the vessel. These decorations are on the outer side of the vessel. And here, this particular vessel, it has inner side as well as outer side decorations. This is the inner side, this is the outer side. These designs are on the inner side. So we have this, we use it as a universal standard thing that outside is always shown on the right side and left side is always for the inner side. Then the surface features that uh, these are all some of those slip. is a textbook definition that I am showing between slip and wash. Slip is thick, wash is thin. And the process of giving the slip and the process of giving the wash, they are different. Slip is a thick solution and you apply all around it. That is it. Whereas in case of wash, they make a very thin dilute solution and dip the vessel in that one and take it out. Uh, so then there is cell slipping. That is, as a result of polishing, it gives a different sheen. Bichrome, that is two colors, polychrome, three colors, preserving a slip, which is one of the practices from pre harappan period or the regionalization phase to integration phase. That is, two slips are applied and the upper slip is removed from selected regions. That is known as reserve slipping. Burnishing and polishing. Burnishing is done with stones or cloth. Polishing, you may use some oil and all kinds of things. Glaze is a chemical. Uh, definition that is it has certain kind of chemicals present in that tool. Then what you see is that when two vessels are, when the baking takes place, two vessels are kept together. So this particular area, the junction of this joining, that area may not receive sufficient oxygen. So what you see is you see something called fire cloudings and smoke clouding. And if you are reading American literature, they are more romantic, so they use the term kismar because two no, ports are uh, together. Then there is something called rustication, which is you have a sandy surface port that is made on the outer side. This is all, some of them are function oriented and some of them are to oriented towards giving it an appeal and uh, some are technological accidents. Then you have different types of decorations. That is, decoration is a very general term. Painting is there inside that you will find lines, deep lines. Applique, that is something which is projecting out. Applique design. Then stamping, you have a uniformity in that one. The kind of standardization question that you asked. When you looked at the stamped designs, 
all of them will have the same size, same, same shape, same design. Then cord impressed pottery, which is, you see it in Eastern India during the Neolithic phase, and mat impressed, paddle impressed, that question also was there. These are all the impressions that you have. Rouletting, rouletting is a, a kind of a technique that uh, was, that evolved in the Hellenistic world during 4th century BC. It is a quagged wheel. Uh, you have, you know, round designs, you have intenders and all those things. It's a peculiar kind of design. That design is rouletting. But there is something called rouletted ware, which is a very fine kind of ceramic that came to India from the Mediterranean world during the Roman trade. It is dated between 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD. We have a lot of work that has happened on that. Then glazing, glazing of the ceramics. So these are all the types of decorations. So now I will show you some examples. This is rustication and this is incised lines. And these are all the incised lines, rustication. Then this is a painting, white painting. This is a white painting and a black painting. Uh, again, incised lines. And uh, these are all, you know, ceramics that are dating back to something around 3000 BC. Mm. Uh, earlier forms, you can see how crudely they are made. There, he can also see the incised lines, you can see a very different kind of inside. So all these features are need to be taken into consideration. This one has a sheen, if you look at it, that is, uh, it's a graver, it's a burnished graver. It goes back to, so it is a pre harappan burnished graver from a site called Barnava in Haryana. You can see nail impressions. These are also designed, this is painting, incised lines, incised lines in one direction, horizontal, vertical, and all kinds of things. Here you can see paintings, and in paintings you can see they are making natural designs and all kinds of things. There are the leaves, animals, etc., etc. Uh, then you have, uh, this is a terracotta toy cart, and this is the wheel of the terracotta toy cart. I'm showing it with a specific purpose, because you can see a line here, a painting here. So probably, you know, the folks, you know, that uh, wheel, they are trying to represent it something like that because maybe this is a part of a crucible and uh, that reserve slipping is this this is it has a sintered reserve slip wear. and these are all again the rustication and all then again some kind of designs now when you look at uh, the ceramics cross section what you can see is that this is it is cut and polished uh, you see the slip portion here, that is external portion. A better example, let me see. Yeah, here you can see. You can see clearly that the external coating of clay. Okay, and then the in, inner area, and you can see different grains and all. So these are all the pores. Actually, these pores were created at the time of, uh, or they were formed during the baking time. What happens is that there must have been some kind of vegetable material there that got burned away. There is again another, and this is something, this you have it from Harappa and Mohanjadaro. This is, archaeologists call it as cutware. And this can be probably used as a bird's cage or something like that. So there is a bird image also, they have kept it here. Uh, again, painting. Again, different types of painting and designs. This is something which you come across in the coastal region sites. And uh, this, is, uh, this, this is from Mohanjadaro. I don't know why, why was it used there, but I have seen similar materials in Sri Lanka, especially uh, in houses where a lot of fish consumption is there. So what they do is that they take the fish and they rub it on this so that the scales go off. So it is uh, something that they are using it for their cooking purpose. This is again a design, beautiful design. Then some large jars. And uh, here again you can see that question you were asking about the base. See, it has a round base. Now we have a modern 
jars than that is used. Here you can see stamping, the same kind of stamping. These are all Indus Valley ceramics, okay, from Mohenjo-daro, and different types of vessels. And now, uh, I just uh, want to get into something. This is a site called Rangpur, uh, located in Gujarat. And there he had the first, I'm um, coming to the first point which I tried to mention that uh, chronology can be understood from ceramic typology. So there was an archaeologist called S.R. Rao, who is no more now, he died some five or six years ago. He is one of the persons who uh, brought a lot of researchers in Indus Valley uh, archaeology. And he gave uh, the, a beautiful ceramic sequence to uh, Indus, Indus Valley period in Gujarat. That is from a site called Rangpur. And what he found was, he found that there are certain kind of changes taking place over a period of time. And these changes can be used to fix the chronology for the ceramic material. So here one of them. See, this is a vessel which is called bowl. So what you are seeing is that a bowl is convex shaped and the convexity reduces, 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 slightly becomes straight sided and then from that straight side it goes into, it develops a concavity, further the concavity, further the concavity and then develops a turning here for concavity deepens, turning becomes permanent, concavity and the turning becomes like a fairy tale, isn't it? But this is reality, this is, he has observed it. So what he is saying is that from the earliest period when the vessel moves up, you see a convexity reducing to and finally becoming concavity. So this particular site, its chronology is, there are three uh, phases, uh, three periods, period one, period two, and period three. Period one is microliths you have. Period two, he further divided into three stages, A, B, C, which is Indus Valley period. And by equating it with Lothal, he said that this is the final phase of Indus civilization in Gujarat, period two A. Two B is late Harappan, two C is transition, and period three is post Harappan. So within that, he found this. So this, this particular thing, this is 2A, 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 2B, 2B, 2C, uh, 2C, 3. But you will get some of these uh, shapes up here and there also that uh, you will have to ignore it. But there is this kind of change taking place. And same is the case with this Dishon stand. You know, it is like this, it becomes slightly shorter and fatter, and then it develops corrugated stem. So this is one of those uh, studies that have been done. And this was questioned a lot by uh, a scholar called Gregory Possel. And uh, he excavated a site called uh, Rojadi. And in that Rojadi, he made, uh, he tried to make his own division to test whether this Rao's hypothesis was correct. And finally, he supported Rao. That is how it. So, what you are do, what I wanted to say is that these are all the kind of scope of ceramic studies. And thank you very much. I hope I haven't taken much.